Hey, welcome back to another episode of Flow with the Grow. And this marks the beginning of year two, which is pretty insane to me, but I'm excited. I, for you today, have a guest. Her name is Taylor Arco. Grab a piece of pen and paper, or if you're listening, make sure to re listen to this because we talk about a lot of stuff anywhere from therapy and life coaching to financial investments and relationship check ins, boundaries, mindset, mental health creating new habits and making them stick. And she answers a few specific questions from you who asked on a post I did on social media. If you find anything from what Taylor says in this episode to be of value or hit home for you, make sure to take a screenshot and put it up on your stories. Tag me and Taylor at Taylor Arco and I am at Sophia underscore Dawn 41. All of that, of course, is in the show notes. So, Let's get right into it, and we'll chat soon. Bye for now. Welcome to Flow With The Grow. I'm your host, Sophia, a health and fitness professional, positivity distributor, and a real-life human being with real-life challenges. Every Tuesday, you'll hear my honest conversations on the day-to-day highs and lows that life teaches us as well as bring you actionable tips that you can implement to improve your health and wellness journey. This podcast will empower you to flow with the inevitable setbacks of life. You will learn what it means to flow with the grow, see through a lens of optimism, and navigate your way to living your best life. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Now let's jump into your daily dose of positivity and growth. Well, welcome to Flow with the Grow. And I first just want to say thank you so much for saying yes, for coming on. You're someone who I started following a couple months ago, probably. And I just love everything that you share, like mental health wise, putting yourself out there. I know you're a runner and I'm also a runner, which I absolutely love. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, You know, I love just being able to get this out there and like educate people on, you know, all the different aspects of mental health outside of just therapy. Yes. I love that. And so can we first just start by you sharing more about you and what you do? And I would also love to know more about why you do what you do. Yeah. So um, if you want to know why we got to backtrack a little bit, but basically I was going to, I was in undergrad and I wanted to be a nurse and while I was pursuing that, I was taking some health classes that talked about health administration and that side of things. And one of my classes focused solely on insurance and the discrepancies between physical health and mental health and how insurance views it. And I just got really fired up because they're not equal and they're not seen as equal by the insurance companies. And it, they make it a lot harder for people to get mental health care. Um, that I think everyone needs. And so I decided that I wanted to be part of the change. I've always been really passionate about personal development and psychology and just how that part of our, like how our brains work. And so, you know, I said, I'm going to be part of the change and I'm going to provide my services and hopefully, you know, make it more accessible and affordable to people. And so that's how I ended up in grad school to become a therapist, but that takes three years to get your license. And like I said, I didn't want to wait. Like I want to give people these services and this education. So I went and got my life coach certification so that I could just get started. Nice. I love that. Thank you. And so you've been doing this for how long now? Um, almost a year. Okay. And I know, so I listened to a couple other podcasts that actually, I think you've been on two or three others and I've listened to them. And so I know that you first started with doing nursing, right? And then you stopped with only just like a couple of semesters left, I think is what you said. Yeah. Um, with a couple of months left, I actually stopped. I was supposed to graduate in May of 2020. And then I was going to, I was starting to apply to nursing programs. And, um, in February, I was like, you know what, Never mind. change course and started applying to, uh, therapist programs. I love that because that's like, I feel like a lot of people would be nervous to do that. They're like, well, I only have two months left, you know, and like it's going into nursing and then to just kind of drop everything and be like, nope, not going to do this. I think it's awesome on your part that you followed your heart and like what you feel like you were 
more wanting to do. How did it feel kind of breaking that norm of like going to nursing and starting your own business, starting your own online business? Like what's that been like for you? Was it hard? Was it scary? Yeah, it was terrifying. Um, And I think anyone that says it's not, I mean, if they're telling the truth, props to them, but I think it's just terrifying. You're putting, you know, your trust in solely yourself uh, when you start your own business and when you, you know, pursue being an entrepreneur. Um, There's no one that you can blame. There's no one else that you can trust. Like it's all on you. And that's a really scary thing. Um, It feels very vulnerable to put yourself out there in that way. And yeah, I just kind of had to, I had to trust my gut. I had to look at, you know, how like the excitement that came with each topic. And it was just impossible to ignore that. I felt so much more excited about becoming a therapist. And I went to therapy and like talked with my own therapist through this process. And I think that was super helpful because transitions are scary and change of like changing your plans is really scary too. So to have someone to kind of be a soundboard for your ideas to, you know, ease your thoughts and all of that was super helpful through the process. Yeah, for sure. So how long have you been doing therapy for? Um, I started going to therapy when I was in high school. And then, um, you know, it's hard when you're a minor, you're relying on your parents and all of that. But then I went back in college and did therapy for a little bit. And then when I graduated, I had to find a new therapist. And so now I currently see my therapist weekly. Nice. I see mine. I was going to a therapist weekly and then um, I go to her every other week now, but it's so awesome because when I first started, I went to someone and I just, we didn't really vibe well. It just wasn't like, she helped me in a lot of ways, but I just felt like it wasn't a good fit. So I stopped going to her and I found someone else. And now I look forward to going. I feel so awesome after I go. Like, it's just, it's been amazing. So how do you feel like therapy for you has benefited you? I'm sure a lot of different ways, but is there anything specific that you're like, this has been a game changer for me? Yeah. So for me specifically, I have generalized anxiety disorder um, and I also have PTSD. So that's what I'm going to therapy for actively. But it's also improved my relationship with my fiance, because if something comes up, I know I'm going to therapy that week and I can talk it through. And even though it's not couples therapy, she still gives me tips. It's improved just my day-to-day thoughts, my productivity. I I honestly can't think of something that it hasn't improved. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, maybe everyone doesn't have anxiety disorder, but I can confidently say that everyone experiences anxiety at some point. And so going to therapy, even if it was just for that, is really helpful because they can give you the tools and resources to work through that anxiety. Yes, for sure. So let's talk about therapy and life coaching. I know that you get this all the time, but what's the difference between therapy and life coaching? And also, like, how do you know, how would someone know, okay, therapy is the way I should go or life coach is the route that I should go? Yeah. So it's a very blurry and fine line. They overlap in a lot of ways because it all comes down to psychology and your approach with the person and how to talk to them and giving them the tools and resources. So they really have a very similar base, but the most simple way that I can put it is that therapy focuses on your past. Um, So whether that's childhood trauma or adult trauma or just adult issues, child issues, whatever it might be, focuses on that and how it's still affecting you now day to day. Whereas life coaching says, okay, like what does your life look like right now? And what do we want it to look like? And how can we get there? What can we do in that in between to make sure we get from point A to point B? So um, some life coaches address trauma, but I really recommend that if you have a mental health disorder, PTSD, anxiety, things, anxiety disorder, um, things like that, that would be for therapy because they can go through insurance. They can prescribe medications. They can diagnose you. They can do certain types of therapy that are proven to help with those disorders. Whereas with life coaching, if you're going through a life transition or you're starting a business, you're trying to, you know, reach your goals and you feel kind of stuck that's what life coaching is for. And I think a lot of people can relate to kind of when you feel like, you know, everything in my life is pretty good. Like I have nothing specific to complain about, but I feel like I want more. I feel like, 
you know, I'm just kind of in limbo right now. That's where you go when you go to life coaching. Gotcha. Okay. So two questions came to mind, but first one is when someone says that they don't feel like they could benefit from therapy, I guess maybe that's when they could do life coaching, but like, I've heard of people saying how they just don't think therapy is for them. Um, and they never tried it before. Or I've had people say that they've had really bad experiences in the past with therapy. So they're just like kind of closed off to trying another therapist. What would you say to those people? Yeah. So one therapy isn't for if something's wrong with you or if you're broken or anything like that, that's its most common use, but I'm really trying to be an active participant in changing that narrative. And I want people to start saying therapy is preventative care. You go and you get your teeth cleaned at the dentist. You go and get your annual checkups with your doctor. Why not do the same for your brain? So that's what therapy is for. So maybe you won't benefit. Maybe you won't see changes necessarily. But what you're doing is you're preventing things from happening in the future. You're you're increasing your likelihood that if something does come up in your life, you're able to handle it because your therapist has given you those tools and resources. So really start looking at it as preventative care. And the second thing is therapy is like dating. Like I know we've all dated someone that we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like, what was I thinking? But like, you're not always going to vibe with every single person on the street, which is why you don't just date every single person you see. And it's the same way with a therapist. Like you all have, you know, different needs and wants and how you want your therapist to address you. And so just getting comfortable saying like, you know what, this isn't working. Can you give me a referral? It's a therapist's job to make sure that the relationship is working. And we're taught in school, if it's not working to refer them because the therapeutic relationship is so important in you improving and whatever you're trying to improve with. So think of it like dating where, you know, it's going to take a few tries to find someone that works for you. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I like the change in mindset, like the perspective of like, just changing it to seeing it as preventative care like that. Like, I love that. And I love how you used it we go to the dentist every year. We go to the doctor. We go to like, get our eyes checked. Like that's, that's so true. Like we all have a brain, we all have mental health that we need to work on and then just preventing like that. I love that. That's Thank so you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So what, okay. What is like the number one thing that you have seen either in your clients or other people, like the one thing that you feel like people are holding themselves back with? Does that make sense? Like, yes, totally. Okay. So I think we have these like identities about ourselves. You know, you think, oh, well, I have anxiety. I'm an anxious person. Or, you know, you even identify like I identify as a runner. You identify as a mom. But where we can get stuck is that we start holding on to these identifications that we've given ourselves and we don't let that go. And that can hold us back. You know, if you identify as someone with anxiety, it can be really hard to actively work to not have anxiety because you're so used to that. I hear like moms all the time, like, I don't know who I am other than a mom. And so like, I think that's where people get stuck is having these identities. And I've started telling people, think about who you are, who who you are, who you could be without whatever it is that you're holding on to that maybe isn't benefiting you anymore. I love that. And that actually brings, so there's a question that someone asked me and uh, he was just asking me as a friend and um, he, cause he kind of, kind of comes to me for advice too sometimes like with health and fitness and mental health. And he asked me this question and I'm like, well, perfect. I'm talking with Taylor today. I'm going to see what she says, but it's kind of like with the whole identifying yourself as something. And he said, he asked me, how do you stay motivated to keep moving forward when it feels like the whole world is against you? Yeah. So one, it's really easy to feel like the whole world is against you. It's really easy to feel like things aren't in your favor and things aren't going your way. And it's okay to have those feelings. Like I'm not, not a supporter of toxic positivity in any way. So feel those feelings but also try and combat them and think about, okay, who is on your side? Who is in your corner? Who is trying to help things go your way? Just to remind yourself of that. But 
we're still going to have days where we don't feel motivated, days where we feel defeated. And that's why I think it's really important to track your progress in any way that it might be like maybe comparing how many customers you had the month before versus now, or, you know, even just comparing your mood now, like now versus three months ago, which is why journaling is so helpful because you can easily see the difference between like your mindset from months to months. It's the same way that we, you know, weigh ourselves or measure ourselves or like keep track of our income, you know? So just finding ways that you're going to be able to compare yourself so that when you're feeling kind of down, you can go back and say, oh, you know what? I am doing better because it's so easy to say, I haven't seen these major changes. So nothing beneficial has happened, but that's not necessarily true. Like even making a dollar more than you did last month or, you know, exercising for one more day, depending like whatever your goals are, just those little things, like those are the things that make a difference in the long run. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like just kind of being more aware of and consciously choosing to seek out the wins of your day or like, you know, from the difference between like now to last month or whatever it is. So it's like, kind of like we have to actively be doing those things with our mindset. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That means that like on a day to day or week to week basis, you have to evaluate those things and keep record of them because it's way too easy to forget what life was like three months ago. So just figuring out what you want to measure for the days where things are tough. Totally. And do you think, would that be the same answer for if just can't get out of a negative mindset? Like they're just constantly thinking like, cause I, so I just a little bit about me, I work as a trainer, uh, like a health and fitness trainer and a coach at a gym called anytime fitness. So with a lot of my clients, like, I feel like they're just always held on to negative thoughts of trying to think about where they wish they could be, where they maybe used to be. And it's like, they just, they're always, and not just the fitness nutrition part, because I like to incorporate mental health and like all aspects of wellness, but sometimes people just only grasp onto the negative and it's like, they can't get out of that mindset. So is there anything else that people could do to help them get out of that? Yeah. So that's actually a thinking pattern and it's a habit. It's a trained behavior. Um, We are creatures of habit, right? Which is why you usually like to work out at the same time every day and go to sleep at the same time and eat at the same time. It's why our body temperature is usually always the same unless we have a fever. Our body really likes this homeostasis, this baseline level. And our thoughts and our brain function the same way. So we get into these thinking patterns and the key is breaking that thinking pattern. But how do you do that? It's possible. It's called neuroplasticity and that's changing the way that your brain is wired and creating new thinking habits. Um, My biggest recommendation, because it's like the easiest, in my opinion, thing to do is gratitude or journaling about a positive experience daily Um, pen to paper is proven to make an impact more than just thinking it and doing gratitude or journaling about a positive experience daily forces your brain to think about something happy and something positive. And what you do is now, you know, that you're going to be doing that daily. So throughout the next 24 hours, your brain is making note of things that it can journal about because it knows that's coming up and it takes time. But if you do that continuously and you stick to it even five minutes a day, you're going to see changes in your thinking patterns. Love that. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of like gratitude and I, um, I haven't done much journaling, but I know pen to paper, like that is huge. That's like, people don't realize the power of that and the impact that I can really have, especially if you continuously do that. So yeah, I'm really glad that you said that. But again, I think that it's like actively doing it. People just need to know that it takes consistency and, and doing it in order for it to change. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Consistency is key, making sure that you do it every day. And that's why I recommend that because I'm not asking you to go and meditate for an hour or drive somewhere. The way to make things consistent is to make them easy and then build them up. But you know, you can't ask someone go run 10 miles a day. They maybe will make it like two days and then they'll quit. But if you ask them to go run for a minute a day, that's a really easy thing to say yes to. And then you can build up from that minute. So journal for 
five minutes a day and then build up to it, but just make it really easy so that you can stay consistent and actually see the benefits. Yeah. Small steps. I feel like people do very well with small little steps and then building from there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. For sure. Uh, So I had two other specific questions that people asked. And one of them was how to be more confident in doing things and crushing goals that are out of your comfort zone and steps other than just do it. Cause I feel like people are always just like, well, just do it. But other than that, and an example that she gave was solo, solo traveling to places out of the country and even in the States. Yeah. So I think thinking about like the benefits that could come, one of my favorite exercises to do with clients is thinking about what would happen if you didn't do it and what would happen if you did do it. And it's kind of like making a pros and cons list, but you're not labeling anything as negative or positive. You're just looking at the outcomes of one decision versus the other and deciding like, which outcome do you want? Maybe, you know, if I didn't do it, I would save money and I wouldn't feel, you know, a little bit worried or nervous, but if I did do it, I would really grow as a person. And then I would feel confident to continue doing it. I would get to explore the world. And those sound a lot cooler and a lot more fun than just like staying in your little box Um, so I think just evaluating like the outcomes of one versus the other, and then with smaller things, maybe not going out of the country, but just, um, you know, being scared to go to the gym because you aren't familiar with the machines and what are people going to think? I like to say like, okay, if I saw someone at the gym and they didn't really know how to use the machines, would I be judging them? Or would I feel like, yeah, get it, girl. Like, at least you're trying, you know, at least you're here, you're learning. So what is your point of view on people doing the same thing as you? And then assume that other people are thinking that way about you as well. Um, I never see anyone, you know, running where I'm like judging them. I'm just like, yeah, get after it. You know, like you're out for a run, you know, maybe the weather isn't good. Like you're tough minded and I'm proud of that person. And so making that assumption that people are viewing you the same way, we're quick to say people are criticizing or judging us, but we don't do that to other people. So I don't think that's true of everyone else around us. Yeah, that's very true. I like how you said to kind of flip it with like the, you putting yourself in the other, that person's spot of seeing you, you know? And yeah, I just see all the time people are just so they think that people are judging them when they're really not. It's just kind of like a mindset shift of just a simple, like changing the way that you're thinking about like that perspective. I think that can help people. So that's a really good, really good little tip right there. Thank you. I, I'm going to use that. <laughs> yeah. The other thing was, how do you find what you're supposed to be doing like in life? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So my favorite phrase is both and I hate either or. And I say that because your career doesn't have to be the thing that you love and you're passionate about. And I think that's a, what's kind of sucky about social media and just the way that things are trending is everyone's like, Oh, I'm doing what I love, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can have your career and you can have like the thing that you're passionate about and your career supports that passion. The thing that I always preach is just make sure that whatever you're doing, you also are doing something that you're passionate about. So whether that's your career or your hobby, do something every day that like feeds your soul, basically. Um, And so when it comes to like finding your thing, obviously, number one choice would be that your career is the thing that you're passionate about. Um, But number two choice is just making sure that you're fitting that in somehow And so sit down and say, what are the things that bring me joy? What are the things that I could talk about? I could give a two hour speech on right now. The thing that you could just talk about to a wall for two hours, because if you can do that, that's something that you have a lot of knowledge on, you're passionate about, and that's something you're not going to burn out from because it's clear that even though maybe it's not bringing you money right now, you're putting time and energy into it. And so it'll be easy to put time and energy into it if that becomes your career. Yes. I think people are always like, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, what's my purpose? And I honestly think, like, I try and tell people too that purpose can be not just one thing, like whatever you're, it doesn't have to be where you're supposed to, like what you're supposed to be doing doesn't have to be just this one thing. It can be multiple things. And I think that it's 
Like, I love how you mentioned how you could talk to a wall without, uh, like you could easily talk about it for hours. But what I love is that when you're, when we're talking to that wall, also it's essentially talking to someone else, but then it's teaching someone else and it's helping someone else. So it's always like helping people in some way. And I think that if people can just find those things or just like pen to paper, write those down, that'll definitely help. And it can change, right? Like, I feel like it doesn't have to be just like one thing and then that's it. Like, I think that. Yeah, exactly. Like you evolve as a person throughout your life. Like what Mm -hmm. my career right now was not what I said my career was going to be when I was five years old, you know, like you're constantly changing and evolving. So that can be constantly changing and evolving. But I think where people get caught up is like, well, the thing I'm passionate about, I can't make money off of. And my question to them is like, how do you know? You've decided maybe like if you did a little bit of research, you would find some people that are doing it too um, and get inspo from them. But I think we're so quick to say, oh, it won't work because there's not already a hundred thousand people out there doing it. So we feel like we don't have enough evidence of success, but like, I really think that you can make it work. You know, people really appreciate and are drawn to people who are passionate about the things that they're talking about. So I would say, just remember that if you're feeling like it won't work. Yeah, that's so true. I agree. What about the person who has that perfectionist mindset. So they just, they're perfectionists and they have that mentality. And why is it, have you worked with someone who is that way? Like a perfectionist? Yeah. I'm a perfectionist. Oh, okay. So why is it important to recognize that? And then also how would being a perfectionist hold you back? Yeah. So, um, a lot of perfectionists also struggle with anxiety and they also struggle with procrastination because if you're a perfectionist, you want things to be quote perfect. Um, and that causes anxiety because you're constantly feeling like it's not good enough. And they can also struggle with procrastination because if they can put it off and do, let's say a project last minute, then they have an excuse for why it wasn't perfect. So then they don't have to take ownership, but if they spend weeks and weeks working on it and then someone is able to still critique it or it's not perfect, they get an A minus on the project instead of an A plus, they have no excuse. So that's where the procrastination comes from in a lot of perfectionists. And I always say like awareness is the first step. So you can't do anything about a situation until you get to the root of the problem. So anxiety, procrastination. Those are the symptoms. The root is perfectionism. And then going into like the root of that root. So like, why do you have perfectionism? What is this perfectionism protecting you from? And it's usually like, oh, well, then other people can't critique me. Other people can't judge. Other people can't say that something should be different if I make this thing perfect. And then once you understand that, then you can take steps towards, um, Get, basically giving yourself positive reinforcement. You know, um, I think that's the biggest thing is like the awareness and getting to the root of the problem before you can take steps to solving that problem. Mm-hmm. So you're, how old are you right now? 22. Okay. 22. So how old were you when you realized, or you became aware, okay, I'm a perfectionist. 22. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so actually I think my, my fiance knew before I did, I didn't consider myself a perfectionist because I said, well, all the time I say, oh, it's good enough. Oh, it's good enough. I said, you're not a perfectionist. If you're, you know, tossing something off to the side and saying it's good enough. I said, and I'm a procrastinator. And I thought for the longest time, perfectionists don't procrastinate because they need to make sure it's perfect. So they're the people doing it weeks ahead. Then I realized there's two types of perfectionists and I was saying, oh, it's good enough because I was procrastinating and it was 1158 at night and it's due at 1159. And so once I learned there's different types of perfectionists and, you know, we just display things differently and then recognizing, you know, I'm quick to not want to try things because I'm not going to be the best at it. That's a symptom of perfectionism is not wanting to try things because you won't be good at it. But how do you get good at something if you don't try it? Mm -hmm. So there's different types of perfectionists and I'm still working through it, but just coming to the realization that I am one has helped a lot because 
I can basically call myself out for it. And so, so I'm assuming that you went to therapy to help with that. And then, or was there anything else that you've been doing that like day to day is helping you with, with all of that? Yeah. So I actually, um, don't talk about it too much in therapy. It was something that I realized while in therapy, but we're mostly just focusing on, um, my anxiety right now. That's what I've been wanting to work through, but with my perfectionism, mostly just journaling about it, holding myself to uh, a schedule so that I can't procrastinate, putting myself in a position where I have to be vulnerable, where people are able to critique me. And then seeing how much positive feedback I'm getting is like positive reinforcement. And so then I see like, oh, it's not scary to be vulnerable. It's not scary to put a project out there where you're nervous about what people are going to say. Most people have really kind things to say and Mm -hmm. most people who critique still have good intentions um, behind the critique. And so it's hard, but really just like challenging yourself and you're only able to challenge yourself if you know your protection mechanisms from your perfectionism. Right. That makes total sense. It's kind of like, cause I see a lot of people say like they they fear doing something because of judgment of others or like whatever it may be, but kind of the only way to get out of that is just to do it again and like to challenge yourself, you know? So that's cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, That's awesome. So going to I had a question because I know that you run and yes. you work out and stuff. So how has running and working out and just more being more mindful of like nutrition, health and fitness, how has that helped you in your day-to-day life of like your business, your mental health, all of that? Yeah. Um, so I ran track in college. So running has been a big part of my life for the last eight years competitively, but I've been running since I was in grade school. It's something I've always been drawn to. And scientifically running or just cardio exercises where your heart rate is above 150 for 30 or more minutes is proven to help with anxiety. So I think that's why I've been really drawn to it. Why I'm like kind of a cardio junkie, but also just having this routine has really helped me. I work out first thing in the morning and developing a routine was the biggest thing in preventing my procrastination. So working out was a big part of it because I just got it out of the way. I feel good. You know, you feel kind of invincible after you work out. You really feel like uh, a badass part of my language, yes. but you know, you're like ready to go. So for me, that's what works. But also as a competitive athlete, I've always was a competitive athlete. I was always um, really mindful of like the food that I was putting in my body And I'm really grateful for that because it wasn't until the end of my collegiate career that I started learning about the gut brain connection. And so the food that you put in your gut, in your stomach, there are nerves that are directly connected to your brain. And so all of those chemicals that are released by foods go like right to your brain immediately. And so that can be a huge cause of some mental health disorders and the reverse is true. Mental health disorders can cause disruptions in the gut. So one thing that you can do if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, is just making sure that you're putting good foods in your in your stomach, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy the connection there is, like from what we eat, our gut health, brain health, and like how that plays a role in mental health, illnesses and anxiety and productivity and all of that. So yeah, the research that's come out in the last few years is mind blowing, truly. Mm -hmm. What about do you have daily habits that are like a non negotiable? Because I know you said that you're a creature of habit, you like routines, things like that. Do you have any specific routines yourself like morning, nighttime, anything? Yeah, so um, in the morning, I wake up, I immediately have a big glass of water. I notice that just my mood throughout the whole day is so different. My eating habits are different. When I have that glass of water, um, it reminds me to drink water throughout the day. I'm bad at drinking water. So having that big glass like sets the tone for the day. And then I, I like to wake up. So I like to take my time in the morning and not rush into things. So I, you know, I wander around the house. I kind of like sit on the couch, look out the window. I journal, I have my coffee and then I go work out. And then after my workout, I start my work day 
And I always take a break in the middle of my workday and go for a walk, even if it's just 15 minutes and give myself something that I enjoy, which is usually going to my favorite coffee shop, gives me something to look forward to. And it lets me decompress a little bit in the middle of the day. So my stress doesn't build up for eight hours straight. And then at night, I don't have a huge nighttime routine, but I always read before bed and I start turning off all the lights in the house an hour or two before I go to sleep to put my body in the sleepy mood. Um, That way it's easier to fall asleep and I get a better night's rest. Try to stay off my phone for the last hour and just do things that make me feel good and calm. Awesome. Was it hard for you to get into this routine and these habits? For me, these ones that I started with in the last couple months, they weren't difficult, but that's because I've gotten really good at learning how to create habits for myself. I've kind of just studied like what works for me and what doesn't when it comes to creating a habit and doing that. But when I started trying to add in new habits to my routine a year or two ago, it was hard because I didn't know how to create habits for myself and what worked. But once I got the hang of it, I can add a habit to my routine really quickly. And it's something that's super helpful because I probably change my routine every few months, depending on what season of my life I'm in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any tips for someone who they struggle with keeping habits? Like they maybe want to go to bed earlier or they want to start eating, even just eating better, working out. What is a couple of tips, things that they can do so that they can make these habits stick? Yeah. So kind of like we talked about earlier, making it really easy. So if you want to work out every single day, don't say, okay, I'm going to go to the gym for an hour a day. Just go to the gym for 15 minutes a day and start there. Make it really easy or go to the gym every other day and then add in days, but making it really small, making it something that you can't say no to. If you want to like I know this is probably not true for anyone, but let's say you wanted to clean the whole house every single day. You don't start with that. You start with, I'm just going to wipe down the kitchen counter. And then once that becomes a habit, then you can say, I'm going to, I'm going to wipe down the kitchen counter and do the dishes. And then you just keep adding to that. Um, And then the second thing is a habit tracker. I use one and I'm obsessed. I've been using it for years, but crossing off a habit on your habit tracker gives you that instant gratification. And that's what Mm -hmm. keeps the motivation until it becomes a habit. So that's what feeds your, your mind every single day, because it's like we talked about earlier, it's so hard to go months and months without seeing progress. And so saying like getting to cross off all of your habits every day keeps that motivation high and gives you like that reward. Yeah. I feel so good to just check things off. And so like starting small, And then also finding a way for that instant gratification. Like those are kind of like two main things that will help people. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I want to switch gears a little bit. So I know that you and your fiance have a really solid relationship, at least what what it looks like. I know every relationship probably has ups and downs, but I know one thing that I, I, love, and I'm sure everyone tells you guys this, but your two week check-ins, that's amazing. And so I just, can you just briefly talk about that and how we can strengthen relationships, whether it's with a significant other or like a friendship family member, I don't know, just kind of speak into that a little bit if you could. Yeah. So we do a check-in every other week. Um, We do it on Sunday nights. It usually lasts like 30 minutes. We do it while we eat dinner. There's no TV on, no phones allowed. It's just our time to like be intentional with checking in with each other. How are you doing? And beforehand, when we decided to start this, we uh, agreed on a handful of questions that we would ask every week. So it's going to be different for every relationship, depending on if you live in the same house, if you have kids, you know, what your day-to-day life looks like, things like that. But coming to an agreement of what are the questions that we want to ask ourselves every other week. An example, some of ours are, what do you want more of and what do you want less of in the next two weeks? Is there anything that feels unresolved from the past two weeks that we need to talk about? What are things that you've been working on? What are things that I've been working on? Intentionally complimenting each other on things that we've noticed 
Um, so those are examples of some of our questions that we go over. But what this does is we can only talk about the last two weeks and the next two weeks, and that's our rule. And so we know that at this check-in, if there's anything that feels unresolved from the last two weeks, now's our time to talk about it or else we have to let it go. Because what a lot of couples get caught up in is arguing about things for six months, bringing up old fights from a year ago, and that's really harmful to the relationship. So it puts us in a position where it's like, we have to solve this. And also we're on neutral ground. We're not worked up. It's not we're not talking about the fight as the fight is happening. And so we're able to hear each other better and come to an understanding easier. That's awesome. How has that improved your relationship? It's amazing. So we started it right after we moved in together. Obviously, that's a huge transition in any relationship. Um, The dynamic changes, you're arguing about how to load the dishwasher and you know, someone's clothes on the floor, whatever it might be, everyone has their own standards of living. And it's very unlikely that those are going to match up perfectly. So moving in is always a hard transition as it was for us. Um, So doing this check-ins just, it put our relationship in a, a better position because like I said, we could talk about any unresolved fights, but we could also compliment each other. And I think that's where we get stuck in relationships too, is we get really complacent. It's not that we're not grateful, but we forget to tell the person that we're grateful for the things that they do. Forget to compliment them. We forget to spend intentional time. If you live together, you're seeing the person every day. And so you forget to go on dates and do fun things because you're like, oh, I see them every day. What does it matter? Um, So having that intentional time, those intentional compliments and giving that gratitude, knowing that at coming up in two weeks, you start to pay attention to the good things a lot more. And then you start to get in the habit of complimenting them. And it just makes the relationship so much happier. Yeah. And I can, like, I think that that's one thing that it's, it seems so simple to do, but I feel like it can help so many people just to strengthen their relationship. And um, just if they're consistent with it, like to have to be intentional with it too, like with anything, but I feel like that's something that I know I want to implement in whatever relationship I have next, but that's just like key, I think. And that's, yeah. So that's awesome. So thanks for putting that out there too. Cause I think that, I think I heard on a podcast that you were on or you got, you, it was a post that you guys did, but I feel like that's helped more people than you probably even realize. So that's <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope so. Yeah. It's, you know, it's also really easy to say, it's again, easy to say yes to, because it's only every other week. Ours only lasts mm-hmm. 30 minutes. And it's a promise to the relationship. It's a non-negotiable. Every other Sunday we do it and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so making that promise to the relationship is just a really important like structure to have. So Very hopefully, cool. yeah, hopefully people try it. And if you do, please let me know because I love hearing um, how it's going for people. Very inspiring. So, okay. I'm going to switch gears again. Okay. Um, so I had someone ask about, uh, she just was like, you know what, if she, if there's anything about investing or like financial type stuff, and I know that you have done, uh, a little bit of investing. Cause I think I saw in your stories one time you posted about, that's one way that you kind of made money and paid for through college a little bit. Yeah. So, and I'm not a numbers person. I finances are just, I just, I do not do well with them. So I need all the help I can get. I just started with Weeble. Weeble is like a, an app kind of like just, I don't know. I can't think of any other, uh, Robin hood, I think kind of like that, but I just got my first stock. My uncle's been trying to help me with it, but I just, I see the value in it. I just don't really know how to do it or where to begin or what to look for. So I would love to know how you got started with investing and kind of your process for that and how it's helped you any challenges maybe, or any tips that people could do to simply start with that? Yeah. So I started my freshman year of college um, and I would just put in, you know, any extra money that I had uh, because I knew that it would grow. And I just started with the app called Acorns. It invests for you. So you give it the money and then it makes the decisions for you. And so you don't have to know anything um, and you're still going to make money back. But if you want to make more money back, because Acorns is great, but investing on your own and making your own decisions about stocks, you'll probably see better returns. I would recommend, I use E-Trade, getting E-Trade and just invest in the things that you use. That's the 
the best advice that I can give. The big name brands that have always been good, those are the brands that are always going to be on the rise. Amazon, Apple, Ford, Google, you know, those brands, the ones that you use every day, those are safe bets. And so starting there and then finding some experts to follow, getting an advisor is super beneficial. And it's hard to put like front money to an advisor and say, here you go, but you're going to see better returns on your investments. So that's another recommendation I have, but in order of easiest is first, I would say acorns, you put the money in there and then you never have to think about it again. Second, E-Trade, invest in the, you know, the, the brands that you use every day, the ones that you know are safe and are going to be good. And then third, getting a, an advisor to help you make decisions. But I can't recommend investing enough because it makes money for you. My portfolio is up you know, almost 20%. And the more money you have in there, the more money you're making. So just getting started, but the sooner the better because it just takes time to grow. Yeah. I I think the only regret I'll have is not starting sooner. Like I'm glad I'm starting now, but it's just like thinking about, okay, I should have started when I was much younger, but that's okay. I think just starting is, is a good step for me, but yeah. So just a few random questions here. First, do you have any, maybe we already kind of mentioned this or talked about it, but any everyday tips that we haven't talked about tips, tricks, habits to help improve mental health, like other, aside from, you know, therapy and life coaching is there any, and journaling, is there anything else that you would recommend people do? Do something that makes you happy every day, whether that's reading or doing a puzzle or painting, just something that truly brings you joy and has no other benefits. It doesn't have financial benefits, nothing like that. Do something that makes you happy every day. Get a schedule that you love that gets you out of bed every morning. And same with your evening schedule, something that puts your day on a good note and find someone to talk to. Like I recommend a life coach or a therapist above all else, because they're professionals, they're unbiased, but just having someone that you can be vulnerable with. So you don't feel like you're in it alone when you're going through the tough times. Yeah, totally. This actually, I have another question off of that. What would you say to someone who, okay, so I'll just give my example. Cause I had a friend and he was going through a lot of stuff and I knew that I was not in a place professionally where I could help him. Like I was there for him. But also I felt like I would be a bad friend by not continuing to like talk to him and be there for him. I mean, I I told him I was going to be there for him, but it was like, at what point do I set that boundary of like, Hey, I just, I can't do this anymore. Like you need to seek professional help, I guess. No, like, so like how, how to know when to tell someone else or encourage someone else to seek that professional help and how to do it in a way that's not so the other person feels judged, I guess. Yeah. So first, just knowing your limits, like you said, like if you're not qualified, if you're not educated in it, then you're doing the person a disservice by pretending that you are basically um, by giving them advice that might be biased, might be uneducated, might be unhelpful. So know that like recommending them is probably in their best interest too, but also reminding yourself, you can only help people as much as like, you can only fill up someone's cup if your cup is full too, right? So protecting your own mental health is priority number one. And if hearing this person every day and watching them struggle is hurting you, then you can't help them. So putting up that boundary of protecting yourself um, and you can always still be there for them while encouraging them to seek someone else. But I think when you set those boundaries, give a good explanation. It's not just that you don't care, but it's that you think someone else is going to help them a lot more and that you want them to have the best help and that you'll still be there, but you can't give the same advice and the same education that a professional could. So for anyone listening, really listen to that part because that's super important. I went through a time when it just, it had a lot going on and it just hit me hard and like mentally it was not good. And so I don't want anyone else to go through that. So, but now I know, like I learned through that to set that boundary. 
what about what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? There's no timeline for your life. Um, and this is what my mom said to me when I decided I wanted to not be a nurse and I wanted to be a therapist. And I didn't know if I would have all the prerequisites, if I would have to go back to undergrad and get a few more classes before I could apply. And I was freaking out because now I'm going to you know, be one year older when I get my license. Or what if I take a gap year and am I wasting a year? And she said, there's no timeline. Like there's no place that you have to be except like where you are and where you're going. So remembering that you're not too old for anything and you're not too young for anything. And it's okay to switch at any time because like, it's just your path and that's all that matters. And it's, you don't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Like some people figure it out earlier. Some people have advantages in early in life and that's okay, but that's not you. And so to compare yourself is very unfair and just puts yourself at a disadvantage because now you're discouraged. Yes. That's so important and so key to remember. I I know that for 2021, one of my intentions was to just stay in my own lane. And because people, I'm 29, uh, almost 29. So I'm 28. And uh, everyone else, like in my grade, my age, buying a house, having kids, they have like their set job and career and all it. They, they like seem like they have it all together, but I'm like, I'm just living and I don't have a house. I don't have kids. And for me, I personally, I'm totally okay with that. But it's also just remembering that I am on my own timeline. I'm on my own path. And then also making sure other people like, because I feel like with my age group and even other people, they compare themselves to where someone else is at, at their age. And whether it's they wish that they were doing what that person's doing or I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, it's like, yeah, we're just totally. like, it's like, so, it's so easy to feel like, Oh, someone's ahead of me in life because mm-hmm. they're, they got married at 23 and I'm 28 and still single, but like, they're not ahead of you because there's no levels to life. There's no order to it. Some people focus on family first and some people focus on career first and there's no, Like, that's why it's important to remind yourself there's no timeline, there's no levels, no one's ahead or behind. Like, Mm -hmm. just because you're older and someone else is in a different point, that's that's the end of it. They're just at a different point. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree. What about, is there a piece of advice that you wish you would have told yourself when you were younger? Probably the same thing, honestly. Like, I wish that I would have said that a lot younger. You know, I wish that I would have known that growing up feeling like, oh, everyone else has their major figured out. So I better just pick one. But also just working on the comparison thing that we talked about earlier. I wish that someone had told me, you know, what do you think when you see someone doing X, Y, and Z? And then, okay, that's what they're thinking of you. Mm -hmm. I would just have tried more things and done more things and put myself out there more. Yep. Totally. Is there a question that Let's see. So what is one question that you don't get asked much, but would be a really good question for people to ask you? I, I thought about this for a long time and I think I just wish that people would ask me more questions. You know, I have people who follow me and they love my stuff and I just wish that they would ask more questions because I have to assume that there's, there's questions out there. People are curious. And I think sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, can be nerve wracking, like, messaging a stranger on, on the internet or on Instagram, whatever, and asking a question, feeling like it's a dumb question or something. But my whole goal is to just help people and help anyone as much as I can. And so I just want people to know that they can reach out to me and they can ask me any question and I'll be honest if I can't answer it. You know, that's the basis Mm -hmm. of my training is knowing what my own knowledge limits are. And so I'll give referrals. I'll be honest if I can't answer something. I'll be honest if I think it would be better suited for someone else or whatever in a different setting. But just I want people to know that like myself and other people in the helping profession, it's called the helping profession for a reason. And so just don't be scared to ask questions. Yeah. I think that's important for me too, because when I see people that I just follow on Instagram and to me, like they're a mentor to me, like they're a leader to me, but they don't know that. And they have all these other followers. And I, 
like maybe sometimes think, well, they won't have time to answer me, or maybe it is a dumb question, or maybe it's, but I think that it can be awesome because we can build connections and relationships. You get your question answered, but then also just learning like as we go through life, which is super important too. So, and I think that for me, if I have questions of other people too, like who I follow on Instagram, it's kind of like, oh, maybe I'll just do it later or it doesn't matter or it's not important. I don't know. But I think it would be, I think that's a really good answer because it's asking more questions is only going to benefit everyone. I feel like, you know, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, okay. We talked about a whole lot of stuff and just a couple other questions. What would be one or two main things? Like if you could choose one or two things where whoever's listening, you would want them to take away from this episode, what would that be? Start journaling. There's so many benefits to it. And it's such a small part of your day. It's five minutes. Just start journaling, get in that habit. If you could add one thing to your day, I would say that's what it is. And then the second thing is just work through those comparisons that you have. I think like we're all, we're all guilty of comparing ourselves and just taking some of the tips that we talked about when that anxiety of judgment and critiques and comparison comes up um, and working to address those because it's only going to help you take steps towards your dream life. Yes, for sure. And going back to journaling, I remember you talking about how when you journal, you write whatever comes to mind. Like, I don't know if it was a story you did or what, but you were talked about how you journal whatever comes to mind, even if it's like, a, I don't know, a desk that you see or like random shit that doesn't even matter. You write it down. So because of the subconscious mind. So can you tell me quick more about why you do that and why that's important yeah, to do that? It's called, it's called free writing. Um, and it's because you don't have to think of questions to ask yourself. And also it's a continuous like thought. So you're never stopping yourself. And that's the thing, like never stop writing. Even if you're like, oh, I don't know what to write, then write that out. And as you continue writing, like thoughts will come up and you can't filter yourself because of that. So you're able to put out these thoughts that maybe you didn't even realize you had because we filter our own thoughts. We say like, oh, I shouldn't think that that's a terrible thing to think or whatever. So it forces you to like, you're not able to filter yourself and that's why I do it. But if that's hard for you, because I understand it is try to practice it, but I also have 30 days of journal prompts on my site so that you don't have to think of questions to ask yourself. If you're not comfortable with free writing, that's another resource for you. Awesome. That's so interesting too. I need to try that. (laughs) So two questions left last uh, first one. So my podcast show is called Flow with the Grow. So I would love to know what it means to you to flow with the grow. What comes to mind? Yeah. So like transitions are hard. Life is hard. Like things come up and that's all a part of growth, right? Like we are constantly evolving. And so just to like flow with it, like there's going to be hard days and it's okay to feel those things. Just letting yourself be in the flow of your emotions, be in the flow of those changes. I think that's the most important thing. Love it. All right. Lastly, I want to know everything about like where people can find you and um, like your website. I know you said journal prompts, you have life coaching. Where can people find you? What do you have available for people? Yeah. So Instagram, my username is Taylor Arco. That's where you're going to find tips, resources. I post about time management, anxiety, how to find a therapist. Like I really just try to cover the whole thing because I want it to be a place where it's not like, oh, she only talks about anxiety. Like here's everything that you need to know to help your mental health. That's where you're going to find the education. My website, taylorargo.com is where you can learn about me my approach to life coaching, the services I offer. You can book a call with me. I also have some extras on my page. So I have freebies, which is my habit trackers and some tips for anxiety relief. I also have a little collage section of just inspo. It's kind of like my own Pinterest board. Think of it that way. I also have a link to all of my YouTube videos that I've done with my fiance, including a YouTube video on our relationship check-in if you want an in-depth of that. 
and a link to all of the podcasts I've been on if you want to listen to other podcasts. So uh, my website is like a documentary of my life, basically, and anything that I could possibly give to you is on there, as well as my 30 days of journal prompts. There's five to seven journal prompts, um, sorry, five to seven questions every single day. Each week is a different focus. The first week is goals. The second week is personal growth. The third week is relationships. And that doesn't mean just romantic relationships. And then the last week is um, physical and mental health. And each day has like a different step, but all of that is in depth on there. And you can check out everything on my website. Amazing. And I'll link all of that in the show notes so people can head on over. And yeah, I know I definitely recommend anyone listening to check Taylor out. And I just want to say, I, I'm so excited for you. Like I just, I've seen your growth from honestly, just low key creeper here, but like, I've seen your growth from when you first started on like kind of on Instagram, I guess, but like when you first started more of like your business of life coaching and posting more about stuff, it's so cool for me to see someone grow in that. And I'm excited to see like where you take this and um, just kind of continuing that. You're going to do amazing things. And again, thank you for coming on, for being so transparent and helpful. And I'm just looking forward to hearing what other people say about listening to this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And again, I'll link everything in the show notes. And I hope you have a good rest of your day, Taylor. And we'll talk to everyone else soon. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Flow With The Grow. I'll see you next week for your daily dose of positivity and growth.